Uh, thanks very much, Steve, and um, thanks to the uh, ICOS committee for uh, the opportunity to present this case today. Uh, we'll be presenting a case of cardiac AL amyloid, and um, we're very lucky that uh, we've got uh, Professor Ashutosh Vachalaka on the webinar today as well, who is a professor of hematology at University College of London and the National Amyloid Centre uh, here in London. And uh, the case will be presented by one of the senior fellows in uh, cardiomycology and cardiac imaging, uh, Dr. Daniel Chen. Uh, over to you, Daniel. Great, thanks, Arjun, and thanks everyone for joining us this morning um, in the US, um, in the afternoon here in the UK. Um, and I'm going to just take us briefly through a case of cardiac amyloid that we've had uh, involvement in amongst the three of us uh, in the last few months, just as a, um, a centerpiece to focus some discussion around management of cardiac amyloid. And then we're going to pick on a few topics within the space of cardiac amyloid management to discuss thereafter. So I'll, I'll kick things off. Uh, so we have um, presenting to hospital in mid-June early this year, a 48-year-old lady who comes in with worsening peripheral edema, worsening exertional dyspnea, and a shortened exercise tolerance, um, and essentially in decompensated cardiac failure, uh, and additionally having several episodes of syncope and collapse prior to her presentation. And she goes to a peripheral hospital first um, before being transferred later on in the piece to our tertiary hospital. This is all framed within the background of a pre-existing diagnosis of systemic AL amyloidosis and multiple myeloma. Uh, importantly, uh, previously she had this diagnosis of systemic AL, AL amyloidosis with dominant cardiac involvement on echo and on CMI, which was already done at the peripheral center. She had already gone on to get uh, scintigraphy, which demonstrated a small amyloid load on the spleen and a fat biopsy uh, result had confirmed and demonstrated the presence of uh, AL lambda amyloidosis. She also did have TTR gene sequencing, which demonstrated a, a wild type uh, genotype. This is in addition to uh, underlying diagnosis of multiple myeloma. And at this point, when she presented in mid-June, she was awaiting a PET-CT and a bone marrow aspirate uh, with a view to proceeding to chemotherapy for the amyloidosis and myeloma. I am, however, going to take us a few months back prior to the presentation hospital in June, where she first came into interaction with the National Amyloid Centre uh, in late February of this year. At that point in time, she'd been referred from the peripheral centre with a six-month history of exertional breathlessness, of dizziness, peripheral swelling, abdominal pain, and some left low limb prestiges and pins and needles. At the time, she already had the cardiac MRI, which suggested underlying cardiac involvement of AL amyloid, uh, and she already had the scintigraphy done. And further investigations were planned with that view to getting her to hospital for initiation of a bortezomib-based regimen of chemotherapy. Importantly, at the time, she had a number of cardiac biomarkers which were done with an anti-pro BMP that was just over 3,000 and an elevated troponin T of 81. Um, and she was normotensive uh, without a significant possible drop in blood pressure as well. The social history of this lady was very important because uh, in addition to being a Jehovah's Witness, she was the sole carer for a 16-year-old son with not a lot of family support within the UK could, who could assist with caring for him. Uh, and she also had an older son who was incarcerated at the time. And a lot of her reluctance to present to hospital uh, for ongoing treatment was with concerns to uh, the care of her 16-year-old son who was in her charge. And those anxieties and con concerns with regards to ability to care for her son were heightened by the setting of uh, the COVID pandemic, which uh, you know, very shortly after initial interaction with the NAC, um, then went full swing within the UK. So just presenting a little timeline of um, how things uh, unfolded. She initially uh, saw uh, doctors within the National Amyloid Centre in late February 
um, and had plans from our end to initiate treatment. Very shortly thereafter, um, the UK went to a national lockdown and um, anxieties around COVID and the, um, the uh, complexities of presenting and being admitted to hospital ensued. And it wasn't, and despite the fact that she did present to the peripheral hospital on a number of occasions during the ensuing couple of months for uh, decompensated cardiac failure episodes, it wasn't until uh, in mid-June when she was transferred to our care um, that we then saw her again with a plan to initiate treatment specifically directed towards her um, AL amyloid. And so you can see in this timeline there that there's actually a lag of about three, three and a half months lost where we were unable to initiate treatment as per our initial plan. And that, that's important as, as things unfold. In the interim of that three, four months, while we had been unable to convince her to stay in hospital for further treatment, we uh, had established her on uh, some medical therapy and this is what her treatment looked like. She was on a couple of diuretics, including furosemide and spironolactone. Um, she was also on doxycycline and some amiodarone. Uh, so we're back now in the current admission in mid-June of 2020. She's come to the peripheral hospital with decompensated cardiac failure. She's had a repeat of her transthoracic imaging showing a significant deterioration in her LV systolic function. Uh, she's had a 24-hour halt monitor whilst in the hospital which shows runs of non-sustained VT uh, and IV diuresis has commenced and uh, transferred to uh, the Quaternary Referral Centre for um, Amyloids uh, in the UK, which is University College London Hospital, um, that transfer was initiated. And upon transfer to UCLH, it's important to note that um, her uh, blood pressure was much lower than had been seen in, um, uh, in February when she, we initially came in contact with her, uh, and her cardiac biomarkers had also increased significantly so that her anti-pro-BNP was now just under 8,000 and her troponins were just over 190. The echo was repeated when she came across to UCLH. Um, I hope that projects well enough for everyone to see. I know it can be a bit jerky because the files are quite big, but um, essentially, you know, of note here, we can see the significant uh, left ventricular hypertrophy with that speckled appearance of the myocardium alongside with a pericardial effusion and, um, uh, and, and with that quite significantly depressed LV systolic function, which had been a departure and change from her earlier imaging prior to February uh, 2020, when she first came into contact with us. So she was commenced on uh, high-dose steroids uh, with a couple of days um, of uh, methylprednisolone, uh, aggressive diuresis was commenced uh, with a fruzamide infusion and the dose of spironolactone was increased. Uh, she was put on a cardiac monitor and the plan had been to uh, stabilize her from a cardiac perspective and optimize her volume and fluid status before then proceeding to organize uh, a, a potassium based um, regimen of chemotherapy. Daniel, this is uh, Dan Lenahan from St. Louis. Yeah. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation and Arjun and Ashutosh, uh, thank you so much for being part of it. Uh, what about the patient's EKG when she was admitted recently? I mean, what did that look like? Yeah, I hadn't put this up here. Um, at the point in time, um, she was in sinus rhythm. Uh, we hadn't noted atrial fibrillation up to this point in time. Um, her QRS complexes, interestingly, were fairly normal um, and uh, she wasn't particularly bradyphonic. So she was always in heart rate around the 70s and 80s. And then uh, was there a, a strain measurements made on the echo that you showed? Uh, there was, and it was depressed, but I haven't put I haven't put up the um, uh, the bullseye pattern, which I'm I'm sure is um, interesting to everyone. But it was it was typical for what would have expected in the context of the the underlying diagnosis. Thank you. No worries. Thanks very much for that. Um, so, following her admission in the initial plan of management. Um, 
She, on the, the first day following her uh, transfer across to UCLH, uh, had a syncope episode. Uh, this happened because she was quite um, constipated. She's very constipated, actually. And so she was given a number of appearances, including an enema um, and, um, and had a large bowel opening after the enema. And because she was soiled and quite uncomfortable at the time, unfortunately, the cardiac monitoring had been taken off for a brief period of time. But during this time she then became had a preceding very short episode of breathlessness and palpitations um, whilst the nurse was beside her had a witness syncope became unresponsive and was seen to not have any respiratory effort or palpable pulse and subsequently had CPI initiated for about nine or ten compressions before she then very quickly regained consciousness and unfortunately as mentioned because she was off cardiac monitoring for that short period of time um, the underlying rhythm was not captured, but she was obviously um, noted as being a, a very high risk patient and subsequently transferred to ICU for close surveillance thereafter. Unfortunately, whilst in ICU, she had periods of uh, bradyarrhythmia and became, uh, which uh, was sinus bradycardia uh, with a heart rate in the 50s and then had three episodes of uh, pulseless electrical activity. Um, and with those three episodes, she had periods of um, uh, ROSC um, and had adrenaline and atropine initiated. There were periods where she was externally paced uh, and she was intubated and ventilated. And the plan had been to transfer her for an insertion of device, but uh, she did then finally have an episode of cardiac arrest associated with PA, uh, from which she was not able to be revived and subsequently died on the second day following transfer to um, UCLH. So that was a, a brief uh, and unfortunate case of um, cardiac primary, cardi primary involvement of uh, cardiac amyloid, where there was um, early mortality at the time that she presented. And it's a case that we wanted to use as a centerpiece just to base some discussion around some of the management points of, of cardiac amyloid. And I might launch into that. Uh, please do interject if you've got other comments. Uh, we will refer back to the case in bits and pieces as we talk about some of these elements um, in the following slides. Yeah, so no, this is this is a super disappointing case, of course, and then, uh, but uh, nonetheless, we see this also, and it's very disturbing, but the, you know, at the point that she was readmitted for heart failure and had an echo that showed, you know, obvious cardiac involvement that was pretty substantial, you know, it's it's a little bit surprising that the EKG didn't show evidence of that, like, you know, low voltages or pseudo infarct. And, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I at least when you see the that, you know, if you were to see low voltages and pseudo infarct pattern, then it tells you how, at least it, from an electrical point of view, tells you how profound the amyloid involvement is. And, you know, the next step is, is that if you were to put in some sort of device, whether you put in a pacemaker or a defibrillator or some combination, it's probably not going to work that well anyway. So it's a really difficult problem. But it sounds like, at least from the EKG, you didn't, you didn't really see that there was a lot of conduction disease. No, I agree with you. So at that point in time, uh, you know, high, high grade AV conduction disease wasn't uh, that evident, but uh, certainly ventricular arrhythmias in the in the setting uh, or, or in terms of having had some runs of non-sustained VT had been noted before. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, I think as the case played out, certainly a lot of high risk cardiac features to tell you that this was um, a, a lady who was at very uh, significant, you, you know, risk of, of early mortality. But as you mentioned, and I will play out a little bit slides, the, you know, the jury will still be out as to uh, the utility of a device and what sort of device you might actually place in this, in this lady or in this sort of patient. Um, and, and certainly that's one of the things I'm going to discuss in, in the following slides. It, it's a, cardiac amyloid is a, a large topic and so I won't be able to 
to do justice to everything. But what I'll try and quickly cover here um, is some of the epidemiology that's been evolving over the last few decades uh, in AL amyloid. Uh, I'll go through the risk stratification and staging systems, which I myself find can sometimes be a little bit confusing and it's nice to, to clarify that. Uh, and then a couple of things that pertain to the sort of therapy that we had established in this lady whilst waiting for it to come in for treatment, um, which looks at doxycycline within the setting of AR amyloidosis, as well as the management of ventricular arrhythmias in AR amyloidosis, uh, whether that's with medical therapy or, um, as you've mentioned, Daniel, with, um, with device therapy. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, we're preaching the choir here, but um, certainly with cardiac amyloid, it's about the deposition of um, protein within the extracellular space of the heart. But it's important to note that the AL fibrils themselves have a toxicity to the myocardium that's independent of um, actual cardio cardiomyocyte disease itself. And uh, this toxicity then leads to directly to organ dysfunction and adverse events. And um, in terms of incidence, uh, looking at both uh, the UK and the European setting as well as the US setting, uh, the incidence of AL amyloid is estimated to be somewhere around the one per 100,000 in UK or 10 to 14 per million per year in the US. Has a male pr uh, predominance and is most often seen in the fifth to seventh decade of life. Uh, and cardiac involvement, which in itself is uh, important in the prognosis of the patient, occurs in 50 to 70 percent of patients with AL amyloidosis. Um, this paper, or this letter rather, uh, which was published in Nejm uh, earlier this year in April, looks at the 11,000 or so patients within the database of the National Amyloid Center here in the UK um, over the last three decades and looks at the shifting patterns in terms of diagnosis of, of different types of amyloid. Uh, importantly, in the last decade or so, the number of cases being diagnosed has increased uh, by more than almost 700 percent, essentially, um, and the median survival amongst patients with AL amyloidosis has increased from a median of 18 months to five years. Um, interestingly, um, whilst AL amyloidosis remains the most common type of amyloid that's being diagnosed and picked up, uh, there's a decline in cases of systemic A amyloidosis, which occurs as a complication of persistent inflammation, perhaps reflecting um, improvements in biologics and treatment of, of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases, but also an increase in the cases of uh, late onset acquired wild type TTI amyloidosis. Uh, and certainly you can see on the graph on the left um, with the um, yellow bars, uh, sorry, the orange bars being L amyloid, um, the gray bars being the um, ATTR wild type amyloid, and the, uh, the yellow bars to the right being the A amyloid. Um, and, and so there's certainly been, particularly in the last uh, decade or so, an increase in diagnosis of ATTR amyloid. On the whole, this increased diagnosis in the last uh, decade um, of a diagnosis of amyloid probably reflects um, our also increasing uh, you know, familiarity and understanding of the use of modalities such as cardiac MRI and bone scintigraphy in the diagnosis of amyloid and the importance of picking up these diagnoses in patients who um, present with things like um, HEF-PEF um, and restrictive cardiomyopathies. However, um, this graph is important because it shows that when split into time, uh, over more recent decades, uh, the longer term mortality is improving in these patients, um, probably because of uh, early and better um, di uh, diagnosis of the condition, as well as uh, in changing chemotherapeutic regimens. The early mortality still remains an issue for us. And you can see that the curves don't diverge early on. Um, and within the first six months, um, mortality still remains a significant problem. And this sort of data is borne out in the American data as well. And this paper uh, from um, data from the Mayo Clinic also demonstrates that. Um, and you can see in the graph on the right hand side that while the curves do diverge with more um, with cases that have been diagnosed in, in more recent years, um, the early mortality is still very high. And in this in this cohort of patients, is still estimated to be uh, more than 20 percent, around 24, 25 percent within the first six months. And we know that in patients with cardiac amyloidosis, uh, one symptoms of 
of heart failure occur and and if they left they are left untreated the median survival is still between four and six months Part of that perhaps is because um, whilst our, uh, you know, the, our knowledge of looking for the diagnosis has improved, there still remain significant delays to the diagnosis and still a proportion of patients that are only diagnosed more than a year from the onset of the initial symptoms. They often have to visit a number of different physicians until the diagnosis is picked up. Um, and, and oncologists or, or people who are involved in cancer care still remain the largest group or cohort of physicians who pick the diagnosis up. And actually as a, a cohort, whilst uh, it's 50 to 70 percent of people with amyloid who have cardiac involvement, cardiologists still represent quite a small proportion of uh, physicians who are picking up this diagnosis. So I just want to touch on the uh, staging criteria because that can sometimes be a bit confusing as to what people are referring to and it's had a few iterations over um, the last 15 years or so and the original Mayo criteria was talked about and discussed in 2004 which utilized the uh, cardiac biomarkers and the knowledge that cardiac involvement and injury in the setting of this disease was uh, important in the patient's prognosis. And here, having reviewed uh, about 240 patients or so, the Mayo staging criteria uses three stages to grade uh, severity of disease and subsequently the associated prognosis, which, which drops quite significantly with um, uh, progressive stages. And stage one being uh, a, a low um, troponin and anti-proBNP, stage two representing either one of the cardiac biomarkers being elevated, and stage three representing both the troponin and anti-proBNP being uh, elevated. And you can see there that as the uh, biomarkers change, the prognosis of the patient changes quite significantly as well. Oh. Move on to um, in uh, the, the the next progression. Then looks at uh, a, contribu a contribution to the um, the staging criteria and score of a European um, collaboration, which sought to further risk stratify patients with advanced disease. And so, in particular, looking at patients with stage three disease and how we could then sieve up further which patients were at even higher risk. Um, and the, uh, the blood pressure was then added into the mix. And so in this group here, um, we can see that um, anti-proBNP and blood pressure were independent predictors of survival in patients with advanced stage three disease. And using a cutoff of an anti-proBNP of 8,500 and a systolic blood blood pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury, uh, the patients were then further risk stratified into uh, three different groups. So namely a stage 3A, stage 3B or stage 3C, where you have uh, patients in stage 3A having a um, anti-proBNP less than 8,500 and a systolic BP uh, greater than 100. Stage 3 having one of those uh, parameters being um, on the other side of, of normal, so, so to call it the other side of the line, and stage three being patients at greatest risk of mortality with an anti-proBNP greater than 8,500 and a BP systolic of less than 100. Further clarification in addition to the uh, Mayo staging criteria came again in 2012, where in addition to the use of cardiac biomarkers, um, free light chain differentials were then added to add a fourth stage here. And you can see that stage one, two, and three remains the same as per the initial Mayo staging criteria in uh, 2004, but um, a free light chain differential um, adds uh, to the staging criteria to create a fourth stage where the prognosis is even worse um, based on this criteria. Just want to then draw this back to this particular patient where we could see that the delays in her treatment actually led to, particularly if we use the uh, European um, staging criteria, criteria where she goes from a stage 3A to a stage 3B and actually almost uh, nudging towards being uh, somewhere in the stage 3C, but uh, essentially a demonstration of the fact that with time untreated, uh, her disease was progressing, um, her, the events uh, nature of her um, her disease had actually got much worse and her prognosis and mortality was also uh, changing. 
Um, having gone through a few of these staging um, uh, criteria that has evolved over the years, I might just ask Ashu if you've got any comments on how things have evolved over the, the last decade or decade and a half, in your opinion, in some of these staging criteria and its use in a clinical setting. Uh, thanks, Dan. I think the, the Mayo criteria are used um, as primary staging for cardiac amyloid, and they still remain the, the sort of gold standard for staging. The problem that has developed over the years is that the two different Mayo criteria, the, the 2004 criteria and the latest criteria in incorporating the Stephen Free Life Chain, have uh, different uh, biomarker thresholds for definition. So each of the stages within the two criteria are not comparable. Certainly here in Europe, we use the 2004 criteria with the additional uh, nt pro bnp based staging of 8,500 um, to define the higher uh, Mayo stage 3B sort of patients who've got an nt pro bnp of more than 8,500. Whereas uh, in the US, the new Mayo criteria are often used by the hematologists because they also incorporate the serum free light chain. So all the criteria will stratify the poorer risk patients, but uh, they're not necessarily um, interchangeable in terms of, um, of the stages of there's some overlap. I mean, this patient clearly started off with being a reasonably early stage patient with a good blood pressure, had actually fairly minimal symptoms and remained untreated for a um, few months. And then there was rapid progression showing the progression of untreated cardiac amyloid. Yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, thank you, Ash. That's the, it's interesting, the European staging system incorporates you know blood pressure which actually you know clinically i think is a such an important finding i mean when a person develops relative hypotension then you know you're really at kind of end stage disease and and so i think in a way uh the blood pressure may be a more uh clinically relevant marker of severity uh, the other question is, is, you know, I like, to, I like to think of a newly diagnosed AL cardiac amyloidosis as really an emergency. And, you know, I think in this situation, because of COVID and concerns about family and all the other complicating factors, you know, she really didn't get treated for many months. And, and I think it, it illustrates the cardiac emergency nature of it. You know, we've had a, a number of patients here, similar similar type of story where the diagnosis with e was either suspected or, or made, and then many months later, for whatever reason, they never got any treatment, and then they represented and ultimately, uh, you know, died shortly after. So. I don't know what 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 is your feeling about that in general. I think I completely agree that it needs to be uh, dealt with on a very urgent basis, and particularly we understand that there is an element not only of the physical protein in the heart, but also of the uh, myocardial toxicity of the serum free light chains. And uh, uh, I don't know whether Dan's got it in slides further, but the only critical factor that we've been able to show far, which modifies the prognosis of these really bad patients, is uh, a rapid hematologic response and a rapid reduction in the precursor light chains with chemotherapy. So the sooner they're treated and the more aggressively they're supported, um, you know, that becomes very crucial uh, for treatment for these patients. And certainly we would, I would agree that it needs to be treated on a very urgent basis. And then the, other, is, uh, the, other, the uh, other piece was that you had uh, SAP imaging i think that's kind of unique to to your location uh and i know that there was development at, at one point about uh a serum ano amyloid protein antibody as maybe a, a coincident treatment with other other treatments for al uh what would you say about all that since you're kind of at the epicenter of that we, we still use um, SP imaging for, uh, for diagnosis as well as uh, monitoring amyloid deposits. One of the limitations of SAP scintigraphy is it's not particularly helpful for the heart. And secondly, it is uh, a human protein that we have to label and use. So there is that sort of challenge. Uh, 
But the other newer cardiac tracers, such as um, flubetapir and flubetapir, which are used uh, for Alzheimer's disease, also seem to be really important in cardiac amyloid imaging. And uh, Shamila Dobala from Harvard has led a number of uh, really important studies with flubetapir in cardiac AL amyloid imaging. And I think that agent will have a have a reasonable role in amyloid imaging, maybe uh, as a useful tool for monitoring amyloid in cardiac and cardiac uh, We've uh, done the phase two clinical trials with the anti-SAP um, monoclonal antibody, but uh, unfortunately we ran into a lot of toxicity problems with it uh, at extra cardiac sites, so we had to terminate the program. So that was very disappointing. Thank you. I just want to pick up on your- There are a couple your... of other monoclonals which are ongoing for Thanks, Asha. I was just going to pick up on your point there, Daniel, about the um, the fact that it is a cardiac emergency, um, and this this particular patient received a lot of delays, which led to the poor outcome. And and you've seen that a lot as well. And I think in this case, whilst she had these very extenuating um, uh, uh, social circumstances, um, it was also I think exacerbated in the context of um, COVID. And uh, I think it's it's a problem that we are seeing within the cardio oncology space. I know we've had a chat about it as it's been topical, but I was just going to invite um, Arjun to talk a little bit about that in this setting, because I think it was such a significant um, a factor in, in the delay to the receiving treatment. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, so, um, yeah, this, uh, this case, um, as as uh, Professor Lenny had mentioned, is is a tragic case and uh, really something that uh, you know n none of us like to experience. But I thought that um, as a group, we felt there were a number of uh, learning points from this, from uh, both the COVID side and cardio oncology management in the COVID context, and also of course from the cardiac amyloid side. So I thought that uh, you know we had learned a lot at our centre with uh, with this case. I thought that it was useful to the wider audience in that regard. So um, there were big delays and the delays unfortunately were uh, directly and indirectly related to COVID. So um, she was contacted uh, kind of a number of times uh, and asked to come in for treatment, for assessment. And unfortunately, because of the uh, home circumstances, uh, she didn't. And um, I'll kind of come on to that in, in the wider context. So this is something that um, the European Society of Medical Oncology uh, presented, uh, you know, for, for patient information, um, you know, just really trying to tell patients that, you know, it, it is safe and this is what should be done. Uh, next slide. And in the UK, the Macmillan uh, Cancer Support Organization also produced something similar. So really um, a wide effort to try and uh, disseminate information regarding COVID to you know, vulnerable cancer patients. Uh, next slide. So this was also obviously seen in America as well. So the American Cancer Society, very similar common questions about the COVID outbreak aimed at cancer patients. So uh, next slide. Um, and again, you know, very specific information from different hospitals. So this from the Brigham and Women's Group, uh, really answering specific questions. You know, what measures are in place to keep me safe when I come to hospital? You know, should I be concerned that the hospital is treating COVID patients? Uh, next slide. Um, again, this is from uh, Cancer Gov. Uh, and here, very, you know, very similar. I'm receiving treatment at a cancer, at, at a medical facility. You know, what do I do about getting treatment? I'm enrolled in a clinical trial. What do I do? Uh, next slide. Um, again, Mayo Clinic saying the same thing. Fly for chemotherapy. Is it safe? I'm participating in a cancer trial. Is it safe? Next slide. Um, and I think this was kind of one of the, the key slides uh, that came up, you know, should I keep my follow-up appointments or is it better to avoid the hospital for the time being? Uh, next slide. So, you know, this is really what happened in our patient, the fear of COVID-19 leading patients to decline critical treatment. So our patient was very scared that if she came into hospital, um, and she contracted COVID, she would die. And that would mean that her uh, son who was in her care 
would be sent to uh, social services and there would be nobody to look after her. She was also scared just if she had to come into hospital for a prolonged period of time for treatment, what that would mean for her son, who would look after her son if she was in hospital for a month or for a couple of months. Um, so this is from the US, the New York Times. And in the next slide, we see exactly the same um, reflection uh, from the UK. This is from the, the Guardian newspaper. Again, just saying people on treatment who are doing their best uh, to self-isolate you know, may become unwell and are scared to come in. So I just wanted to kind of highlight this in the context of our case that uh, despite numerous attempts to try and get her in, there were some real you know, family issues related, you know, exacerbated by COVID, which unfortunately, you know, really delayed her presentation. Uh, thanks, Deb. Thanks very much for that perspective, Aiden. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to push on because we've got a couple of uh, other points that we want to um, explore in the next few slides. Um, and namely, this first up, I just want to have a quick chat about the use of doxycycline within uh, the context of AL amyloidosis. Uh, so as we've mentioned a couple of times in our discussion so far, the AL fibrils are uh, cardiotoxic themselves. And so the ability to block light chain cardiotoxicity using small molecules has therefore been an attractive option. Um, and this has been suggested with doxycycline. Uh, so in this uh, paper, which was presented as a letter to the editor um, here, it looks at the use of doxycycline and its impact on early mortality uh, in AL amyloidosis. Um, in the experience of 30 patients uh, in whom they had started 100 BD of doxycycline um, compared to 73 matched controls uh, and matched using cardiac disease stage, the anti-proBNP age and the free light chain differential. And what we can see is that in patients who had doxycycline used alongside with their chemotherapy, there was an increased overall response rate um, of partial response or better uh, in comparison to the patients who didn't have the doxycycline on board as well, and a, a better uh, um, complete response rate in that group as well. And importantly, particularly when you look at patients with uh, stage two or three A disease, um, patients who were receiving doxycycline in comparison uh, compared to the match controls had a uh, better uh, 12 month and 24 month survival rates as demonstrated on the curves here. So this concept of um, doxycycline as, a, um, as an adjunct therapy is, is still currently being looked at. Um, this paper, which was uh, presented or published by D'Souza and a group earlier this year, uh, is a stage two trial looking at um, adjuvant um, doxycycline once again and adds to literature that was presented by the last group. Um, in this single arm trial of 25 patients with AL, um, they use doxycycline uh, in conjunction with chemotherapy. Um, and um, you can see that from the rates that there were no deaths in the first month, the early mortality was 8% at three months and 12% at six months and 20% at 12 months. Um, and that actually represents lower uh, early mortality rates in this patient cohort than uh, you know, historic um, studies have suggested. Um, and uh, in, particularly in patients who were survivors at the end of 12 months uh, in this small study, um, the hematological response was also improved and backs up what was seen in the earlier data. And what we do need following on from here is um, better and more, more robust trials to suggest that this is the um, uh, this is the, the the way to go and that adjunct uh, doxycycline is is an important part of therapy for these patients uh, and hopefully that will be coming soon we know that there are stage three trials underway at the moment looking at this um, and um, and hopefully we'll see the results of, of that are you Daniel? Are you aware of who who's organizing that trial? Because I mean, we would be happy to contribute to that. Yeah, know? true. I don't actually know who is so leading the, as principal. Do you know, Ash? So the trial is being run by um, the uh, European Rare Diseases Group, and uh, European Rare Diseases Group unfortunately doesn't cover the United States in terms of funding. So when we discuss the trial, various other US groups are interested, but wouldn't were not able to run the trial because of the funding and sponsorship issues. 
I mean, is there any way we can contribute to this data? I mean, in the sense that, you know, well, we we agree with the, you know, your reports before and, and the general process of, of giving doxycycline. Uh, and so we're just doing that clinically and there's no, you know, there's no research to that. It's just we're, we're well, I'm very happy to sort of put you in touch with uh, the team who's running the trial and see whether there was any possibility of uh, including any centers who might be interested. Great. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, great. Did, did you have any comment on, on the use of doxycycline? I, I, you, you know, you've obviously had a lot of experience, Ashu, and, and some of the data there is yours as well. Um, did you have anything to add or any further comments? No, I mean, we, we use it routinely and a lot of other places use it routinely. There was a, there's another small phase two study from, uh, from Milwaukee, which seem to suggest some benefits. So I think it's kind of being adopted quite a lot, but I think we do need sort of more formal phase three data to show it actually genuinely benefits over and above its antibiotic effect. Certainly. The, I mean, the other important component of managing these patients, particularly from a cardiac perspective, is the presence of ventricular arrhythmias. Um, and we know that a lot of different arrhythmias come up um, in these patients, whether that's atrial and uh, atrial fibrillation in particular, uh, whether there's AV conduction disease, or whether there are other ventricular tachyarrhythmias that are involved in these patients. Um, I've heard a couple of studies about the sort of um, ventricular arrhythmias that we sometimes pick up in these patients. So this is a, um, a study that looks at 20 patients who had severe cardiac AL amyloid, so either Mayo stage 3 or 4, and symptoms of syncope or presyncope. And they had a, a reveal device or an implantable loop recorder put in uh, if they were thought to be eligible. Of those 20 patients, 13 patients died with a median overall survival of just 60 days. Um, and in all those patients um, in whom the device was able to be interrogated um, after they had died, what was seen was that the initial change was actually a bradycardia uh, to less than 35 beats a minute uh, with um, complete heart block in six of those cases. But in all those patients, the terminal event was actually PEA. And whilst we think that uh, non-sustained BT is a large contributor contributed to sudden cardiac death in these patients. Um, actually, only one episode of rapid VT was picked up from those de devices that were interrogated. And that episode of VT occurred and was preceded by uh, extreme bradycardia uh, uh, degenerating into VT, uh, which was then spontaneously reverted after 60 seconds. And you can see here, this is a log of those patients here, and it's a busy slide, but mainly just to show that if you look, um, if you look down the third column that looks at pre-cardiac arrest rhythm, um, is actually significant bradycardia uh, as well as complete heart block that is um, that is pre that precedes their death, rather than what you know we suspect to be VT. Um, but the, the data is not all um, all that homogenous either, because if we look at some other data from the Mayo Clinic, uh, and here looking at Holter monitor findings in patients with um, AL amyloid, um, their Holters picked up a large proportion of non-sustained VT uh, as well as AF and found that the presence of those two rhythms um, was prognostic um, and, and affected you know, the, the prognosis at three and six months. And so it becomes difficult to know what to do when we see uh, non-sustained VT or even when you do see um, uh, more sustained VT episodes uh, in patients with AL amyloid. Um, and certainly we think about the treatment in terms of whether um, pharmacotherapeutics are more effective or whether device therapy is actually indicated in these patients. But with pharmacotherapy, we generally see poorer outcomes um, with drugs such as beta blockers and amiodarone than we would in other patients. Um, beta blockers are difficult because in the context of the restrictive, restrictive cardiomyopathy, a lot of these patients have a heart rate dependent cardiac output and therefore tolerate very poorly the addition of beta blockers. Um, and there's also a possibility of significant drug interactions depending on the underlying chemotherapeutic regimen that's chosen. Um, amiodarone uh, as well is not without its own problems um, and it can often be associated with prolongation of QTC in these patients and degeneration to torsades. 
um, and it can also impact on the systolic function through its beta, um, beta block activity um, or can also lead to complete heart block. And in some of the big data analysis, uh, looking at patients with amyloid versus patients without amyloid, the incidence of complete heart block associated with um, with beta, uh, with amyodarin, sorry, is higher in patients with amyloid than the general population without amyloid. Um, uh, uh, an underlying, underlying diagnosis of amyloid. And that really makes the, um, the use of amyloid in this patient population quite um, uh, problematic because you know, the, the presence of bradycardia uh, is, is key and important uh, in terms of their prognosis. With that regard, um, I mean, we often do still use uh, amiodarone in our patient cohort. And I, I just wanted to um, see if you got comment uh, on that, Ashu, in terms of experience using amiodarone in this patient cohort. I think that's a very difficult one. I mean, we have um, sort of now adopted a policy of using amiodarone at least prior to botazimate therapy, as we've had a lot of patients who used to get ventricular arrhythmias after, after the use of botazimib, including sudden deaths, and uh, a number of patients ended up with device implantation prior to therapies. And since we adopted amiodron, we've not required the same degree of device implantation. Uh, however, it has to be used with caution, given all of the things that uh, Dan has just said, and particularly the risk of bradyarrhythmias arrhythmias uh, remains with these patients. I don't think we've ever seen uh, torsad in any of the patients thus far. But there is generally QT prolongation, which is a, a, a worry with these patients who already have a prolonged QT to begin with. So we are using it, but I think we have to use it with caution given uh, the potential for uh, problems with uh, amiodron and also its much broader toxicity in this patient group. Yeah, I think this is a very difficult topic, this part right here. Uh, I think if you're going to use any antiarrhythmic in these patients, it would have to be amiodarone. There's really nothing else. And then uh, the pro and that mainly that is for the management of AFib. But the uh, you know people with VT, what to do is is such a controversial question. And there was a, a nice review in 2020 and Jack EP that uh, kind of went through the current literature. But the bottom line is, is that I don't think anybody has a strong recommendation what to do, and you have to individualize it for each patient. So, Ashutosh, I would be curious, what would you say? Uh, we have a, we had a patient this week, actually, this past week, that 52-year-old, new diagnosis of AL, just got started on treatment, and his uh, his EF is about 40 and he has obvious cardiac involvement of his AL, and he has non-sustained VT. And the, the general recommendation from the hematology team is, is that they're going to give him uh, combination therapy at this point and you know, hope to get him to a stem cell transplant. And my original contention was is that if we're going with that kind of aggressive therapy where ultimately we're going to put it you know to to get him ready for a stem cell transplant should we place an ICD in this patient who is at high risk for sudden death and I would be curious if you had an opinion on those types of cases I think, as you said, these, there isn't really a right answer for these. And uh, we have, uh, you know, we, patients who have recurrent VTs, we would probably consider a device because they would remain at risk. For patients who have got an occasional run of an ill-sustained VT, there probably the role for devices is much less clearer. Uh, we would really worry about doing botazimib to these patients because at least in the early days of botazimib, when we're using it a lot, we had a lot of patients die of ventricular arrhythmias about typically 24 to 48 hours after they receive the potassium. And uh, our, uh, our kind of successful revival rate for these patients has been very dismal. Um, so we then became very proactive in the use of AMEO in these patients. And that's really how we sort of evolved into using AMEO for patients, especially if they had uh, documented VT and they had no evidence of uh, any conduction disturbance or heart blocks. 
I mean, the two choices are whether he gets a device in and then gets botazomib based treatment or gets a neodrum and then starts a botazomib based treatment under cardiac monitoring with a plan for device with the arrhythmia that's still persistent. Uh, Barry, I don't know if you're still on, but you had wanted to ask a question before and I cut you off, so I don't know if you want to chime in now. No, that's okay. It's more relevant to the discussion earlier, but curious, any of the arrhythmia data, has anyone parsed it out between TTR and AL or all, all the studies that I've seen seem to be lumped together? I think the TTR scenario is very different from the AL scenario. I mean, the TTR patients seem to um, get a lot more of conduction disturbances and um, atrial fibrillation with much less risk of these sort of acute sudden deaths with ventricular arrhythmias. And they also seem to tolerate beta blockade a lot better than the AL patients do. So I think the arrhythmic scenario with ATTR would be very different. And I guess the approach to their management would also be quite different in than these acutely sick AL patients where uh, trying to use antiarrhythmics is more challenging. The beta blocker becomes a huge problem because of hypotension. Um, and then the chemotherapy makes everything much more difficult. Uh, this is uh, Mo Alomar from the University of South Florida and uh, Moffitt Cancer Center. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Just wanted to get the panel's thoughts on um, uh, uh, AFib and aflutter ablation uh, in, in, in these patients, especially younger ones uh, who may be lower stage disease. We've had a couple of those who uh, uh, had better success sending them for an ablation rather than having them on antiarrhythmics, which is uh, to Dan's point, really you're stuck with amiodarone in this patient population. And you definitely don't want a 40 year old on that for a while. So I don't know if had anybody had any experience with this strategy. Yeah, I mean, I think we don't have any sort of systematic experience. It's it's all case by case or sort of personal uh, observations. I mean, I think that in in selected patients, you know, the EP team might think that the ablations are better uh, than medical therapy, and I wouldn't necessarily argue with that. But the problem is, is that I don't think it's highly successful. At least it doesn't seem like it has a sustained benefit. That's just my general observation. Yeah, I, I agree would uh, echo that as well. Uh, we, we sent uh, for this, uh, they potentially have been kind of successful at the time of the procedure, but they really haven't been long lasting and they've ultimately ended up back on some form of anti-arrhythmic therapy. Yeah, agree this with that is, too. Uh, this is Courtney Campbell from Ohio State. Um, I'd say right now we're actually starting to get, as um, the EP folks are more aware of amyloidosis, we're getting diagnoses after multiple failed ablations for AFib. So they're starting to do PYP scans or look for light chains, mainly the transthyretin, um, after they've failed multiple rounds of AFib ablations. Thanks for the discussion, Ram. I'm just going to steer back to a couple of the, the top things that we had mentioned in the early discussion about um, device therapy and, and then push on from, from that uh, platform. Um, and, you know, I think we all agree that, uh, or we can, we have experienced that the jury's still, still out on device therapy and the sort of devices that might be useful in these patients. Um, and if you look at the data that's been pre uh, looked at, presented on uh, the utility of ICDs, it's still a very heterogeneous space um, and, and that's contributing to the difficulty of knowing what to do. Um, and so I present a couple of papers here, but um, there are a couple of papers that put device therapy in a slightly better light to say that maybe we should be, um, you know, it's, it's something to consider. Um, and we look at uh, this cohort of 15 patients with uh, advanced AL amyloid um, who were considered for device therapy if they had non-sustained VT and some syncope or presyncope, or they had sustained VT and it's used as secondary prevention. Um, and the criteria that they used was as demonstrated here, which is basically patients who had um, those two factors of non-sustained VT, pre-syncope or, or syncope, but also had a reasonable life expectancy. Um, 
And this is a, a further uh, sort of um, decision algorithm, which is suggested by the Stanford MLO Center, which also picks up that uh, concept of uh, looking at sustained VTN, non-sustained VTN, and life expectancy before consideration of an ICD implantation. In the first cohort of 15 patients, which is presented by Ashu's group, um, four patients had therapy from the ICDs, three for ventricular arrhythmias, and one for pacing in the setting of bradyarrhythmias. Um, and two of the four uh, died. Uh, however, in uh, the first uh, patient who died, they had v VF uh, had successful therapy delivered, and it was only about 10 or 15 days after that they had more VF and then had um, another shock bite. At that point in time, was not able to be shocked out of it. And the other died not related to the VF that they had. They had VF and then was successfully treated from the ICD, um, but died of other complications uh, sometime later. Um, but importantly, in this cohort of patients, of uh, while small, the overall survival um, at 12 months was 82%. And if you look at a, another group um, uh, led by Avad et al., they had um, patients who uh, had an ICD implanted here. Um, and of those patients who had an ICD uh, implanted, um, they had uh, um, five patients who had ICD therapies delivered appropriately, um, and four of the five patients had a termination of their arrhythmia, um, and only one of the five patients had a VFRS in whom the ICD defibrillation was not able to terminate the arrhythmia. Um, and it, once again, you can see that following successful ICD therapy, actually the survival time um, for some of them stretched out to uh, 19 months. But um, as mentioned, the, the data still remains heterogeneous. Um, and if we look at whether um, ICD does alter outcomes, you can see here that um, in terms of uh, patients who have ICD implanted, there's not necessarily a split in the curves um, in terms of more, uh, mortality when you compare them to patients who did not have an ICD. And equally to mirror um, some of the more positive, um, very, very small cohorts. Um, this study by Kristen et al. Uh, from the German group in 2008 presented pa uh, a study of 19 patients in whom they inserted an ICD. Um, and actually, a uh, majority of the patients who died with their ICD actually died with um, uh, EMD. And so in that setting, the ICD wasn't actually contributing to uh, the, the improved mortality. And so it's, it's really hard, I think, looking at all the data um, to decide you know, who should get an ICD and whether that's utility. Uh, it does end up becoming a case-by-case -case basis and, and the discussion still continues. Uh, but alluding to, I think, what you had mentioned actually earlier, that um, uh, the importance in mortality of a lot of these patients is trying to um, to clear or reduce the uh, light chain load. And uh, this paper by Manwani in 2018 demonstrates that quite nicely, because if you look at the particularly the, um, the bottom left-hand uh, panel, is the patients at one month who have achieved either complete response or very good partial response that show, show a, a, go on to show a very significant improvement in mortality compared to at 30 days patients who have not demonstrated at least a very good uh, partial response. And so actually the, their response to chemotherapy remains a very important and significant um, uh, parameter uh, for their prognosis. Um, so I think, you know, it's been great having some um, questions as we went along some of the data and having some good, robust um, discussion. Uh, cardiac amyloid still presents as a very uh, challenging thing to manage, um, and I think there's a lot of room for, um, for research to guide uh, us on what to do with regards to mitigating the myocardial toxicity from the AL fibrils and to manage these ventricular arrhythmias, whether it's via medications or device therapy. Um, and, and we've managed to touch on that. I don't think it's comprehensive in looking at what's a very large topic, but I think we've, we've managed to scratch a bit of the iceberg. Um, and we've brought ourselves essentially to time, but are there any other further questions that we can field? Particularly, we've got also Arjun and Ashu here to, to, um, to take some of those questions. Yeah, this is a very attractive, a fantastic presentation. You know, lots of great data, lots of great questions that arise. One thing that, um, you know, just to, to touch on the, the use of digoxin, I know it's been considered an absolute contraindication for a long time. I know some people are, are rethinking that and are using it judiciously. 
just curious how many um, folks here are using it and and uh, what their decision process is. I think if if I use it at all, it's in somebody that I can't control their rate uh, uh, with you know beta blocker or whatever because they don't tolerate it, and you know they're they're in a fib, then I might use it because uh, it won't affect their blood pressure. So I mean, there are occasions where I use it. Yeah, so I think it's pretty much the same here. It's not necessarily our first choice. Um, we may have to use it in certain situations, exactly as uh, Dan said, in case of uh, blood pressure issues or, or, or any other issues, but it's not the first choice. Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, the whole thoughts on ICDs and, and how to manage ventricular arrhythmias or risk of sudden death in these patients is very difficult, I would just say, but, you know, the algorithms that you propose, for the most part, they start off with the idea that, you know, a, a patient's going to live for a year. Do you know if they're going to live for a year or not? And that is very difficult to pin the tail on the donkey for that one. You can't really, uh, without any, it's very difficult to say whether somebody's going to live for a year or not. And so I would suggest, and this is again my opinion, not necessarily anybody else's, that if you're going to treat them aggressively, you're going to put them on a clinical trial for TTR amyloidosis, or you're going to give them multiple drug, drug therapy for their AL and ultimately go to a stem cell, then I would favor dealing with their risk of sudden death you know, with an ICD or, or some other uh, adjustment, as opposed to somebody where you're not going to treat aggressively because their disease is end stage, then I wouldn't put a device in and that's it. So it's a subtle difference between deciding whether they're going to live for a year or not. Yeah, I mean, I think at first glance, the data looks, you know, it looks kind of you know, bad for, for, for putting in devices, you know, a lot of people dying from PEA or, but if, if, if you know, two out of 15 are surviving from it, uh, then that's not very different than, than primary prevention for patients with, with cardiomyopathy. So I, I think it's very reasonable to consider in, in patients that are um, at higher risk. Yes, I think uh, the way we kind of things locally is very much a individualized basis going through the amyloid MDT and I, I just think that this is still an evolving space and I think Ashu has probably uh, gone back to clinics has unfortunately left us but he um, you know in his experience at the National Amyloid Center there was a clear change in the approach um, that was taken to these patients so Previously, all the patients would have a device put in kind of similar to the data that was shown, but then on interrogation of the, the actual devices, you know, it was very much found a lot of PEA and this kind of thing rather than, you know, shockable rhythms. So I think it's still an evolving field, you know, amiodron kind of has grown from the experience, you know, locally at the National Amyloid Center in these patients. But, you know, as Ashu kind of mentioned a number of times, this is really a, an, an area where, you know, the phase three trials are really needed. Yeah. Thank you all so much. That was really, uh, really fantastic. And you have a, a power group presenting it. I really appreciate all of your input and expertise. And, you know, thank you again. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Uh, Steve, do what do we have going on next week? Actually, uh, nothing next week, but the week after November 5th, we'll uh, pick up with the Journal Club. Great. All right. Great. Thank, Thank you, you all Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.